Let's work on it. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Young, for inviting me. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, what I'm going to do is talk for 20 minutes about my new book. <laughs> what I tried to do in the book was I tried to discuss American foreign policy during the unipolar moment. I tried to talk about a policy which is commonly called liberal hegemony. This is the policy that the United States, foreign policy that the United States pursued from roughly 1990 until January 2017, when President Trump moved into the White House. And this was, and it's very important to understand this, a highly ideological foreign policy. Now, I believe that when a country like the United States lives in either a bipolar world or a multipolar world, it has no choice but to act according to the dictates of realism, of realpolitik. But during the unipolar moment, from roughly 1990 to 2017, during those years, the United States was free to pursue an ideological foreign policy because it had no rival great power. And therefore, you don't have to worry about the balance of power. You are Godzilla. This is the United States during the post-Cold War period, during the unipolar moment. So it was free to pursue an ideological foreign policy. And of course, the United States is a liberal democracy. And not surprisingly, the United States pursued liberal hegemony. It's a highly ideological foreign policy. Now you're saying to yourself, what exactly is liberal hegemony? What exactly was the United States doing during the Unipolar moment? What we were doing was trying to remake the world in America's image. And there were three dimensions to our strategy. First, we were trying to make every country on the planet a liberal democracy. Another way of saying that is we were trying to make every country on the planet look like us. We wanted to make China a liberal democracy. We wanted to make Russia a liberal democracy. And the Bush Doctrine, the famous Bush Doctrine, was designed to make all of the countries in the greater Middle East into liberal democracy. That's the first goal. The second goal is to get every country on the planet, integrated into the open international economy that the United States had played the principal role in creating. In other words, you want to get everybody hooked on capitalism. You want to get China and Russia both deeply embedded in that international economy, that open international economy. Remember the efforts that we went to to get China into the World Trade Organization, to get China deeply hooked on capitalism. And then third, what you want to do is you want to get all the countries in the world deeply embedded in international institutions. Again, get China into the WTO, get the Russians into the IMF, get the Russians uh, into the World Trade Organization, and so forth and so forth. These are all very important things to do. And this is all part and parcel of making countries look like the United States. So this is the basic goal of liberal hegemony. And it is, again, just to repeat myself, not driven by balance of power considerations. Because the United States does not have to worry about the balance of power because it's the unipolar. Many of you remember the famous Frank Fukuyama article, The End of History. That was an article that was written in 1989. And it basically said the United States had won against fascism in the first half of the 20th century, won against communism in the second half of the 20th century. And 
Now there was only one possible political alternative for every country on the planet, and that was liberal democracy. The optimism just oozes off the page. We thought it was going to be easy to do this, right? And uh, we therefore basically set off on a crusade. The United States became a crusader state early in the post-Cold War period. And our basic aim, again, was to remake the world in America's image. What happened? It was a colossal failure. Let me just give you three examples. One is the Bush Doctrine. The Bush Doctrine, as I said to you, was designed to turn the Middle East into a sea of democracies. We thought in 2001, after we invaded Afghanistan, knocked off the Taliban, and put Karzai in power, that we had basically created the foundation for liberal democracy in Afghanistan. Then we decided in 2002, 2003, that we were going to invade Iraq. We went into Iraq thinking we were going to turn it into a liberal democracy. And then eventually we would go to Syria, go to Iran. And then you'd have a whole sea of liberal democracies in the Middle East. How well did that work out? It was a colossal disaster. The amount of murder and mayhem that the United States has created in the greater Middle East is hard to believe. Next case I'd like to talk about is NATO expansion. NATO expansion coupled with European Union or EU expansion, coupled with the color revolutions, remember the color revolutions designed to spread democracy into places like Ukraine, that's the Orange Revolution, into Georgia, that's the Rose Revolution. The idea was we were going to move these alliances eastward. The EU, NATO, could promote democracy in Ukraine, promote democracy in Georgia, consolidate democracy in Hungary, consolidate democracy in Poland. We're remaking the world in America's image, creating liberal democracies, spreading institutions, the EU and NATO eastward, getting countries hooked on capitalism. What do you think spreading the EU eastward is all about? How well did that work out? We ended up with a war in Georgia in August 2008. The Russians were not going to tolerate any more NATO expansion or EU expansion or color revolution. And then in February 2014, the Ukraine crisis came. Poisoned relations between Russia and the West. Failure. Third example is engagement with China. What were we doing with China? The idea was that we got China hooked on capitalism, integrated them into the open international economy, got them integrated in insti into institutions like the World Trade Organization. The end result would be that China would become a responsible stakeholder, a responsible stakeholder. And then China would become a democracy. And of course, once China's a democracy and America's a democracy, we're guaranteed to live happily ever after because democracies never fight against each other. There'll never be any human rights violations in China, and so forth and so on. How well has that one worked out? You've noticed that engagement has gone down the toilet bowl, and we're now involved with containing. The United States is now containing China. In fact, we're going beyond containment, in my opinion, and we're now engaged in rollback. The United States is now playing rough. And has China become a democracy? Does China look like the United States? You all know the answer to that is no. So that's another failure. The Bush Doctrine, US policy, or Western policy in Eastern Europe, failure. Engagement with China, failure. Why don't we fail? Failed for two reasons, two main reasons. One, nationalism, and two, realism. With regard to nationalism, the fact of the matter is nationalism is the most powerful political ideology on the planet. And nationalism is all about sovereignty and self-determination. And countries like China and countries like Russia do not like countries like the United States sticking their nose in their politics. 
Second reason it failed is because good old Bush didn't agree on Paul the team. And what happens here is when the United States moves NATO up to Russia's borders, Russia sees a military alliance that was a mortal foe of the Soviet Union during the Cold War, now coming up to the border, the very border of Russia. They say this is just unacceptable. The idea that Ukraine, the idea that Georgia could be turned into Western bulwarks right on the Russian's border, not going to happen. That's what Vladimir Putin said. The United States may be pursuing liberal hegemony. The United States may not be concerned with realism, but the Russians are, the Chinese are, and the Russians are not having any more of NATO expansion. The end result is the Ukraine crisis. I can point to all sorts of other examples. The point is, these policies fail because liberalism was trumped by nationalism and by realism, and especially by nationalism. Very hard to be a crusader state in the age of nationalism. So the policy failed. The question is, where are we today? Liberal hegemony is finished. And it's finished for two reasons. The first reason is Donald Trump. Understand <laughs> that Donald Trump ran against liberal hegemony. Just think about the three strands of liberal hegemony. Spreading democracy, an open international economy, and international institutions. Trump ran on the platform, we're getting out of the business of spreading democracy around the world. And you know what? He won. He's in the White House. <laughs> because enough Americans agree with him to help get him elected. So because of the coming of Trump, which is inextricably linked with the failure of liberal hegemony, Trump is in the White House, and that's good evidence that liberal hegemony is dead. But there's a more important reason, my second reason, why liberal hegemony is dead. And that is, we are no longer in a unipolar world. Because of the rise of China, and because of the resurrection of Russian power, we now live in a multipolar world. And remember what I told you at the very beginning. When you're in a multipolar world, all of the great powers, including the United States, have to operate according to the dictates of realism. They cannot operate according to ideological considerations. You can only do that in unipolarity. This, of course, just to turn to China for a second, is why we have moved from engagement, which was a liberal policy, to containment and even rollback. That is because we are no longer in the unipolar moment. We are in multipolarity. And the United States is in the business of competing with China and competing with Russia, which is exactly what you would expect. That, my friends, is the end of the story. Thank you.